Frank is in Iowa right now. Uh, and I think one of the interesting things to, uh, to talk about, uh, since we're all up here in Canada, watching what's happening in the news <laughs> with what's going on in the U.S., I think there have been many, many politicians through Iowa this, this month, from what I've been seeing. Uh, and I know we're going to yep. talk a little bit about Texas soon. But, Frank, can you talk a little bit about um, the, the mobile home parks kind of being, you know, almost bulletproof? Uh, and, and even though we've got the economy uh, the way it is in the U.S. with some Canadians going, why would we want to invest in the States with things going on down there uh, the way they are? Yep. But, um, yeah, that would be great to, uh, to get a little bit of uh, sure. background on that. Yeah, no problem. Well, we've always thought of mobile home parks as being contrarian because mobile home parks do best when the economy go goes bad. And that's why they've done so well since 2007. So 2007 was the start of the U.S. Great Recession. That's what they call it. And throughout that entire period, when our unemployment rate in the U.S. went up above 10 percent and financial markets plunged and the home prices collapsed, mobile home parks actually did better than ever because as those things collapse, it just forces more people needing affordable housing. Another big benefit we got was quantitative easing in U.S. interest rates, so they dropped the U.S. interest rates down significantly to the lowest level of American history. And then meanwhile, because of all the demand in housing, apartment rents went up the highest they've ever gone up. So since mobile home parks, our competitor, our apartments, as their apartment rents went up, we raised our rents. So at the end of the movie, we had more customers, higher rents, and lower interest rates on our debt than any time in American history. So wow. if you model the next great recession we're going to have, pretty much same story. People may have noticed that our, our Fed has decided the only way it can manipulate markets and kind of jumpstart the U.S. economy is with lower rates. So they've been raising them gradually recently, trying to get them high enough, they can drop them down again. And I think that's kind of where you're at. You know, some people project the next U.S. recession to come in 2020, others say 2021. Uh, I was an economics major at Stanford, so the, the hands-on bet would be 2021, because typically the recessions hit at the start of, an, of a new presidential term. So I don't, I'm not sure what happened next year. I'm pretty confident what happened the year following, probably. Nobody knows how severe it will be, but again, we like recessions in the mobile home park business. In fact, there were people in uh, 2007 going around at industry conventions reminding people to vote for the worst candidate, because let's keep the economy in the dumpster. Because wow. that's uh, what works for us. So oh. that's why we like our little niche. We're probably the only real estate niche in the U.S. that actually benefits from economic collapse. Oh, because amazing. all the others, they, they need prosperity and we need to reverse. And for us being in Canada, I think uh, the other thing that that means is that uh, the Canadian dollar is going to get a little bit stronger against the U.S. dollar. So we're going to have a little bit better buying power when we get started. Yep. Yep, that would be the actual thing. You know, it, it, we represent the Canada, probably what Mexico re represents to the U.S., because Canada is, is richer and more stable than the U.S. And so there, there's always buying opportunities here, perhaps more than Canada, because you guys compete with much stronger buyers. And you do have a mobile home park market, for example, in Canada, but it's very small. It's about 5,000 parks total. It's a tenth the size of the U.S., your cap rates are also very, very low. And I yeah. think that's why Brookfield Asset, which is a Canadian REIT, chose to buy a company called North Star RHP, uh, which is a U.S. portfolio of mobile home parks about three years ago. Uh, rather than try and buy anything in Canada, they just couldn't make any sense of the Canadian cap rates. So I think that's why you see Canadians buying into the U.S. Okay. And the U.S. is not a hard market to understand. It's basically just continually down. It's kind of depressing, but other than the stock market, if you look at our employment situation here, uh, since 2007, half of every job is in the range of minimum wage to $15 an hour, and our fastest-growing industry in America is fast food. Wow. Which I don't know what it is in Canada, but fast food is kind of an odd thing. And again, yeah. why fast food is growing is people get professionally poor, so they're trying to buy even cheaper food. And so uh, that's that's kind of it. So we we like being in that in that sector. We think that's the growth sector of America is basically things that are able to get people what they want at a cheaper price, given the fact that people's incomes are declining. Mm -hmm. It's I mean in some ways it's really sad, right? I mean the, the, there's the recession. There's there's a, there's a, a low minimum wage. There's 
all this fast food. I mean, it sounds awful. And I know that Joan, you and I have talked about, you know, coming in as the trailer park girls and actually trying to help build community. So one of the things that we're really passionate about is, is making sure that we provide safe, clean, affordable housing for people who, who need to have good housing because so many other aspects of their life are shit. <laughs> yep. No, you're, you're, you're exactly correct. That's what mo most of the owners today are trying to do is trying to bring these old mobile home parks back to life. Mm -hmm. Because bear in mind, the average mobile home park in America is now half a century old. Mm -hmm. So we're taking stuff that, that's been let go in many ways, both structurally and, and spiritually and financially with mom and pops who never kept the rents up to market, mm -hmm. never put any money back in the property. It has massive potential but in its current situation is dreadful. Absolutely. And so it's kind of a win-win because you can make the properties nice again, which makes the people happy, and yeah. then you can make money at it. So it's Absolutely. kind of the best of all worlds. Yeah, and it's interesting because when, when Joan and I were looking at the parks in Michigan, you know, one of the things I did was phone the police station uh, when we were looking at a couple of the parks. And I remember one of the parks, oh my goodness, the, the police officer that I spoke to said, oh yeah, I drive through that park. It's like the Jerry Springer show in there. <laughs> he just talked about yeah. how, how, you know, he was in there all the time. There were fights, there was abuse and, and mom and pop owners just they don't have the heart to to kind of run it like a business, and so they really get taken advantage of. And, and again, I think you yeah, know if you, I, if you if you if you talk to the police and, and when they tell you things like that, it is always one or two residents, right? So in a hundred spaced yeah. property, it's always like the guy in lot four and the guy in lot fourteen. And all yeah. mom and pop would have to do is non renew the lease of those two people, and the yeah. police would never be there. Exactly. Right? A lot of the yeah. mom and pops, as they get older, they lose their energy, yeah. lose their enthusiasm, feel yeah. sorry for people, and they don't look at the greater good as far as that one person is spoiling it for yeah. 50 neighbors. It always yeah. drives us crazy. when we, Even when we start trying to bring these things back to life, there's seemingly always those one or two people in the park that just don't get it. They either yeah. have no interest in being good neighbors or they just can't understand how to live in society. Exactly. And they've got to go. You know, it's just, yeah. it's the same thing you find when you reposition reposition any asset type. If I go out and try and rebuild a downtown square, I was just in another another city, and I was in fact in over in oh gosh, where was I? I was in Indiana, and so in Indiana they're rebuilding an entire downtown block, and you look at all the businesses that were displaced, and there's many of them. But they just needed to go, mm -hmm. right? And you can't let those few people hold back progress. And that's what happens in parks all the time. So, yes, we've also had the same thing where the police say, oh, my gosh, we're in that park every week, every day. But it's always the same guy. And we can easily solve that by just evicting that person. Yeah, exactly. And Mandeep just made a comment. That's why you always have a property manager so you're not emotionally involved. Right? That is exactly true. We yeah, have an on-site I mean, manager in every property. It's absolutely essential. Yeah, I mean, this, this couple that we that we uh, spoke to, I mean, oh, my God. They were, like, I think the gentleman was on his sixth heart attack, and they were still trying to manage this park. And, and uh, yeah, it, it's heartbreaking from, from both ends because nobody's winning in that situation. They're, they're literally no, not, them not at all. No, that's correct. We, 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 we had a property park. recently yeah. where the – the manager that, that came with the property was on an oxygen machine. And we said, let's go walk the property. And they could not go more than three or four homes down before they said they lost all their energy and had to return to the office. And wow. when you're in that situation, obviously you cannot maintain control if you can't go out and physically even walk the property. Mm -hmm. And that's what happens a lot of times. Again, because the industry is about a half century old. So all these moms and pops, when they built these things, were all – Younger folks, they hired younger people to manage, and everyone has brimming with enthusiasm, but 50 years later, the enthusiasm is gone. Hey, Frank, when um, maybe you can touch a little bit on, uh, I'm just thinking about the people that we have on the webinar tonight, and, you know, I, I would say that the majority of them have a little bit of uh, real estate investing savvy, hence why they're involved mm -hmm. with Ren. Um, and because there aren't a lot of mobile home parks in Canada to kind of use as an example, 
maybe you could kind of just uh, quickly compare some of the fundamentals between, say, purchasing a multifamily apartment building versus purchasing a mobile home park and what those differences look like in responsibility level, uh, uh, costs, uh, cost percentages, maintenance, um, just to kind of show the difference of what it's like to buy stick, you know, stick built versus a mobile home park. Sure. Uh, all right. Well, on the expense ratio of mobile home parks is typically about 30 to 40 percent, which is fairly much in line with self-storage and apartments and other things. But our big thing is we don't have a lot of capital costs. That's the big difference. So we don't own the mobile homes, at least most of the time we don't. We're always trying to own just own the land. So when you own the land, you don't have to have reserves for the roofs going out and toilets overflowing, all that kind of stuff. So we We've sidestepped that issue by the unique construction, which I think is the only one of its type in all real estate where the residents own their home and we own the land. So they're kind of a stakeholder in the business, although they have no ownership. And so in this manner, all we're responsible for in most mobile home parks is for the road to be free of potholes, the common areas are mowed, the water and sewer is working, the power is working, none of that we even are involved in. So it's very, very low management. Uh, most things that happen in their life, whether they have a fire in their home or they can't afford the payment, we're not in the loop. No one calls us up and says, my roof is leaking, uh, my home is settling. That, that's not our thing. So that's, that's probably the big difference. I mean, there's uh, the only thing similar to mobile home parks are all in the same family, RV parks, which are also in the same genus species of what originally started out as campground back in 1920. But uh, that's, that's, that would be the biggest difference. I know a lot of people who own apartments tell me all the time what bums them out is they feel like they're making profit, and then suddenly they have to go out and replace the roof or replace the balconies and wipes all the profit out. And then they, under, they don't understand why they're even doing it. Uh, the, our, we're different because you never have that one big capital call. And I think that's key to why we, being here in Canada, can own a park somewhere in the U.S., is because that the, the constant requirement for attention or the need to be at your property is not there uh, in this asset class like it is potentially others. Um, so that's, that's one correct. thing. Yeah, most, uh, most owners visit their properties either once or twice a year. So it's, it's, we're extremely hands off. Now that doesn't mean you can abandon it, then you'll be just like moms and pops. But you can manage it today with your on-site manager and technology very easily. In fact, you can manage, if you if you use technology efficiently, you can probably not go visit your park ever and still be okay because the, the tools are there to allow you to do that. Yeah, and it's interesting you say that when we were um, talking with uh, Tony. Remember, Joan, he had bought uh, uh, one of your uh, one of your attendees at Mobile Home University. He had bought a park. Uh -huh. Uh, and he hadn't seen it yet. And, and Joan was like, I don't think I can do that. <laughs> yeah, that, I mean, I wouldn't go to that level because you'd want to see it before you buy it, right, yeah. as far as, you know, having a handle on it. But after you buy it, it is not uncommon mm -hmm. to not see them, but very, very infrequently. And if your manager is good and if your collections are good and your property condition videos are good and your occupancy is stable, there really is no reason to go down there because you've already seen the property Thanks to HD video, there's really no reason to go down there unless you just kind of want to. Yeah, fantastic. Right. Really, really cool. It's just, yeah, I mean, I'm going to look at a couple of places in, in Victoria this week and I keep thinking, <laughs> is that the right thing to do? Do I even bother? <laughs> yeah. Right. Like family or, or homes because uh, the whole mobile home park thing. I mean, gosh, you know, we almost bought that lake before with, you know, 35 sites for under $600,000 and I'm looking at a, a house on a 10,000 square foot lot for the same price. So. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, no, I understand. Uh, I think it's great that you've given us some background on just the mobile home park industry. And, and I know for those people who have attended other webinars and, and seen our in-person meetings, we've, we've also talked about that. Um, I think maybe it would be great for us to chat a little bit about some of the areas that are really hot for, for investing. Sure. Um, we've certainly sure. looked in, as many people know, we've looked at parks in Michigan now, we've looked at parks in Indiana, and we're adding Texas to the list. Mm -hmm. And uh, so maybe, Frank, you could kind of give us some economic insights on those three states as uh, 
at, for investing for mobile home parks. Okay, well, let me first break it break it up regionally. The only region in the U.S. that people find weaker than the other regions is the southeast, which would be the U.S. states of Mississippi, Louisiana, Alabama, Georgia. Uh, those have always been at the bottom of the pile, even going back to the 1960s, because they've always been behind the eight ball on employment. And although mobile home parks are all about people who don't make a lot of money, they have to have a job. Now, Alabama has kind of rebuilt their economy over the last two decades, and their numbers are now not bad. So the average home in, in Alabama is over $100,000, and their unemployment rate is decent. Uh, Georgia is completely carried by Atlanta. If you take Atlanta out of the mix, Georgia has all kinds of economic problems. And then Mississippi, it's hard to even name a U.S. city of any size in Mississippi. The average person can't even name one. And then Louisiana, we have Baton Rouge and New Orleans, but as we all know, New Orleans was flooded. So it's got its own unique problems. Other than that one little region, really all regions are good. Uh, we, we have been extremely fond of Texas. That's where we started out. That's where my first park was. That most of Dave's parks were there. We've always been very large players in Texas. We really like the state of Texas, but we were also like really anything in the Great Plains and the Midwest has always been our forte. But not that you have to even be there. The West, the West Coast is good. The Northeast is good. The only part that's a little different is the Southwest. I'm sorry, the Southeast. Southwest is also good. We have parks over in New Mexico and those states. And, and just in terms of Texas, I think one of the things that a lot of, again, being Canadians and seeing what's going on at the border, um, I mean, I look at it and I say, if there are immigrants uh, who are going to be settled in Texas, those are potentially going to be tenants for us in the future. Um, so is it a worry uh, that there are, you know, that there's a political, uh, no, I don't want to say instability, but there's a, there's some fighting in Texas, or does that just make you look at it and say, oh, I smell opportunity? I, I don't, yeah, I mean, the, the bulk of what they're fighting in Texas over on immigration isn't going to really impact the mobile home parks, because our residents are all employed, they have normal jobs. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, every everyone that I know in Texas, they bet all their applicants you have to have proper identification in order to run a criminal credit check so i don't really think that's really going to impact i mean it may, it may impact class c and d apartments much worse because we're things where you have like four families in an apartment or something but i don't i don't think that's going to be the big issue with immigration per se um but there's there's no question you know, what really drives texas is, is really not that what drives Texas is it's always been very pro-business. So, so it's always gotten a lot of large industry moves down there. And, uh, and also it's a warm area, so a lot of people want to move there. We have some parks to ride down on the border. And, uh, you know, they are, they are very popular with people from the north who want to go somewhere that's hot and retire somewhere that's hot. So uh, Texas has a lot of personalities, right? I mean, it's a very, very large state. You've got big cities, you've got rural areas, you have vacation areas, you have coastal areas, you have beaches. So it has a little bit of everything. It's like its own country, but it's yeah. always done very well with mobile home parks. You know, the yeah. housing prices are strong, the employment is high, there's always a huge demand for affordable housing there. And, and, I, and I would assume that, yeah. I would assume that the metro area, because as you as you teach us, we're always looking for a metropolitan area of, uh, of 100,000 or more. Um, yep. So I assume because of the, the size of the cities and the proximity of the cities in Texas that that creates a fairly strong metro area in a lot of the state. Yes, it does. I mean, te Texas has first tier cities, which would be Dallas, Houston, San Antonio, Austin, and perhaps El Paso. And then you've got, you know, still very large second tier series, uh, cities on top of that. And you've got places like Longview, Wichita Falls, Texarkana. So there's 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 a lot of population around Texas because again it's very fast growing. Nice. So even areas that seemingly might be a little bit remote still have really good stats. We own a lot of stuff, for example, down around Austin, and we're in, and a lot of it's not in Austin proper. We have some in Austin proper, but a lot of it is skirting Austin, sometimes 20, 30, 40 miles out. And it still has incredibly strong demand. So Texas is just kind of magical as far as the demand for affordable housing. Now, I don't know how 
luxury housing does there because I'm not in that that sector. But on the affordable side, the demand is vast, and it never it never has really gone down. It was strong back in the '90s when we started buying the first parks there, and now 25 years later, it's still strong, pretty much still in the same markets. I mean, nothing much there has changed either. Just before we started the webinar tonight, Frank, I did a little quick look on Texas and. And uh, you had mentioned about it being pro-business and that's definitely, that comes through loud and clear. Like, you know, they want people to invest. They want to help you set up your business. They're attracting foreign investors. They're, they're helping foreigners set up businesses in the state. So the, and, and like you said, I mean, it's a big state. I mean, we think about how big Canada is and, uh, and how big our provinces uh, all are. And, and Texas is, you know, ranks up there with the size of some of the Canadian provinces and people sometimes forget that that when you look at how yep. big it is, like I've had people say, oh, why would you want to go to Texas? It's so hot down there. And it's like, have you seen how big Texas is? <laughs> I mean, yeah, no, you're, you're right. I mean, another, yeah, and also as Canadians, people may or may not be aware, America is very fractured right now. You have red states and blue states. Mm -hmm. And the red states are pro-business and the blue states are anti-business. And Texas is a red state. In fact, most of what they call the flyover states are red states with the exception of Colorado and Minnesota. And Illinois, so uh, there in the middle of America is almost all red. Um, both both coasts is almost all blue, like a cage fight between I don't know the forces of the blue and the forces of the red. But the important thing to remember is the red states are traditionally landlord friendly, and te Texas is very very landlord friendly, very pro business. You know, you look at New York by comparison. I know people have followed New York recently, but you had uh, the Oh gosh, Amazon scared away from their their one headquarters off of New York. The AOC scared them off, and then on top of that, they just declared rent control. So mm -hmm. the state the state has gone completely wacky. And mm -hmm. if you invested in New York, it would be a catastrophe. So it's it's much safer right now to be in the pro business states. I mean, it may be over time the blue states work their back way back around to being pro business. They probably will when they're when they're unemployment stores and their tax revenue declines. But until then, we prefer being in those nice steady red states because we don't have to fight fight the state or city hall and things things are fairly stable and normal. And it's interesting because people often say, how come you're not investing in California? I mean, you know, being Canadians, we want to be in the sun and it's a nice easy flight, but you know, similar kind of thing. The, the Residential Tenancy Act in California, I mean, it's, Certainly not pro landlord, is it? No, the problem with California is if we could turn back the hands of time, we'd probably move our whole portfolio to California if I could have bought them in the 70s and the 80s. But today, the mobile home parks in California are so insanely expensive. You've got an average lot rent in Los Angeles of over a thousand a month. You have niches in Los Angeles up to almost three thousand a month. Wow. Uh, there, uh, there's one seaside community that's at five thousand dollars a month, <laughs> and so you take those numbers and then you parlay on top of that some of the roughest laws in the United States on being landlords. Uh, there, there are, and there's a law in California, for example, called failure to maintain, and failure to maintain means that if you don't maintain the property, the residents can sue you for damage to their quality of life. Wow happened to ELS, one of the REITs that Sam Zell has, it started with nothing more than algae and a fountain at the entrance. And it ended up in a giant lawsuit where everyone claimed that that algae in the fountain, coupled with other meaningless items like not, the weed eating not being good enough, had destroyed these people's quality of life. And a California jury awarded them $1 billion on the first oh round. Goodness. I think it was a billion. It was either $100 million or a billion. It wow. didn't matter. It got overturned on the appeals court, and they ultimately settled it for ten or twenty million. But nevertheless, who wants to operate in that kind of environment? I mean, it is yeah. it's a, it's a state that is caters to people who know how to use the system, mm -hmm. and it's got all all kinds of problems. You probably have seen the street people problem there and other issues. Mm -hmm. So to own something there, you have to be paid handsomely to do it, which means you have to get giant rents. But having bought the parks before the giant rents were normal. Hmm. And so we're we're just a little late. If we were to be in California, to be a happy California investor, you had to pretty much buy it back in the 70s and the 80s. Hmm. And I myself, you know, when I owned my billboard business, I owned a billboard company in Los Angeles. 
I remember how it was back in the late 80s, early 90s, and L.A. was predominantly broke, and you could have made good deals back then. This is after the Northridge quake and all the riots, but that was long, long ago. Today, the same things that I look at in Los Angeles, I just look at a Los Angeles real estate magazine, they're roughly now like 10 times what they were back when, when I was there. So I think, we, I think we all just kind of missed the boat on California. Mm-hmm. Well, maybe Texas will be the next California without the... Without well, a lot the... of California investors invest in Texas under the assumption uh-huh. it will be the next California. Uh, if it is the next California, it will not be the next California as far as laws. Mm-hmm. So that's, that's the key. Yeah. Uh, I talk to park owners in California all the time, and they tell me uh, the average eviction is now taking one to two years. And that it's it's so out of whack now that the, when a tenant can't pay you, you immediately go to them and offer them ten or twenty thousand dollars to leave. Yeah. Because it's wow. better to give them twenty thousand than to go into evictions court for two years, at which time you'll lose twenty four thousand in rent plus mm-hmm. legal costs. And so you're looking at thirty thousand dollar loss on every eviction. It's absolutely insane. It's not very inviting for investors. That's for sure. It might. No, might it's be not inviting for investors. That's exactly correct. <laughs> Huh. So um, just a couple of things as well. There's a, a couple of questions that are, are coming up and uh, we'll encourage people mm-hmm. to, uh, to ask some questions. Uh, is Texas a no, uh, is there no state tax in Texas? Or is that uh, Texas has no personal income tax. Wow. It, it, it functions off of property tax and then typically oil and gas revenue for the state. Mm-hmm. So that's how they pay their bills. But wow. it and Florida and I'm not sure if Nevada does or not, but there's, a, there's just a few states in the U.S. that do not have personal income tax. Mm-hmm. And then there's also a few states, like I think Tennessee, that only has personal income tax, I believe, on um, interest and dividends, I think. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, it's worth a study. But, yeah, Texas is unique in, in, it is in that small club of people who do not have personal income tax. Mm-hmm. It's interesting because we've got, um, I mean, we've got uh, investors uh, from, from the U.S. We've got people from Idaho. Um, where else did we have people investing from? A couple of different states in the U.S. I think we had someone from Montana and Washington, of course, being so close. So it's interesting mm-hmm. for, uh, for them to be looking at, I mean, for us as Canadians, it's, a, it's completely different being invested in, in the U.S. in general. Um, and for our, our folks in different states, they're just, it's, it's easier for them, but it's still interesting to learn about uh, what's sure. happening in different states. So that's really neat. So yeah, we're pretty, pretty excited uh, about it. Um, <laughs> can't, can't wait to go down there and look at some, some parks. Uh, we, uh, we initially started with, uh, with thinking that we were going to do a, a small park. And then when we started talking about the mobile homes and the fact that we were going to, uh, to start looking at mobile home parks, so many people were interested that we thought, okay, maybe we can just go from, you know, skip the small park and just go straight to a, a, lo- a much larger park with investors. Um, and so that's where we're, where we're at now. And uh, it's just, it takes a little bit longer because there's more paperwork to do. You have to get your agreements together and, and it's, uh, it's just a little bit more of a process, but um, it's easier to get financing for a larger park. And, and that, I think, is both from being from, uh, from Canada and also um, some of the American folks that we've spoken to have said, yeah, yep. people don't want a loan. It's to lend uh, less than a million dollars. So we're, you know, we're looking at parks more uh, over the, the million five range uh, so that we can have some investors come to play financing. So, you know, Lisa, it's actually, it's actually changed even, even stranger now because the U.S. government got uh, mad at uh, Fannie Mae Freddie Mac saying that they had not followed the law called duty to serve in the U.S., which means you have to serve people of all income groups. So what they made them do is they made them start doing more mobile home park loans, and now over 50% in dollar value of all mobile home park loans come through Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, Hmm. which is called agency debt, and it's even bigger still. So agency debt is about $2 million and up. So the easiest form of financing today would be the biggest, which is the Fannie Mae Freddie Mac agency debt. They hmm. even are forced now to make loans in rural areas and all kinds of stuff. And they have no limitation on the number of loans they can do per year. So wow. it seems kind of unfair and odd to people that you would think it'd be easier to finance small parks 
But actually, it's easiest to find in giant parks, and it gets impre- increasingly harder the smaller you get until you get down to seller financing, which saves the day because it bails out the, low, the lowest end of it. But, yeah, mm-hmm. ba- regular U.S. bank financing, traditional bank financing, that is the most difficult of all. That, and that's kind of what we we learned and experienced in our um, couple of parks that we had under contract in Michigan yeah. is that going with local yep. bank financing was the hardest option of all. And and that yep. um, that we really needed to up the purchase price to to move up into that kind of next level and then the next level beyond that into the agency debt. And and I think that what we've experienced with, uh, and just, just, just for the people on the line, with the people that were interested in investing with us, they also wanted a piece of the action and um, they wanted to be a partner in this process and, and, and really be in the game with us. And to do that, you actually need to be invested in a much bigger park to produce the yep. revenues. You need to be able to support your, your partnership. And uh, so yep. everything kind of pointed us in the direction of, of abandoning kind of the smaller approach that we thought we should start off with and really going with something uh, much more substantial. And I mean, maybe Frank, you can kind of comment on the the kind of level of parks that we'd be looking at in the million and a half to $2 million range versus something in the $500,000 range. Sure. Well, I mean, the, the function of parks is all based, of course, on, on the lot rent. So if you're looking at park in Texas, parks in Texas run on lot rent all the way from a couple hundred dollars a month to as much as six or 700 a month. Let's just take something in the middle there and say it's three hundred and fifty dollars a month lot rent. So if three hundred fifty dollars a month lot rent, if you if you multiply that out times twelve, times point six, and then times ten, you're going to end up with uh, lots that are worth, let's say, in that example, twenty five or thirty thousand dollars per lot. And you then multiply that by you see you have to buy a park to get a million dollar loan. You have to have a million. $1.5 million deal. So it, it all points you to, to deals that are roughly around 50 lots and greater. Although if your lot rents are high enough, I've seen deals all the way down to 25 lots that still qualify for conduit debt. Hmm. So it's all a matter of your occupancy and your lot rent. Um, so there's, there's, in fact, there's, there are parks in California that are as small as, as 20 lots, which, are, which can get agency debt. And then there are parks in Alabama that could be 300 lots and still wouldn't qualify because the rents are $75 a month. So it's, it's kind of all over the map, but that would kind of give you a rough idea. You'd be looking for things that are roughly about 50, 50 lots and up probably. And um, um, just for a frame of reference, I think there's, there's certainly, like everything else, quality levels in parks. Um, and so I think we, we're kind of looking in the – in the B range of parks or C plus range of parks. And even those sure. are, are very, very nice. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. And I think people well, get- one, you know, one, one thing I think, and again, I, I, I've only been to Canada a few times, but I've never been to a Canadian mobile home park, but I have seen pictures of them. And Canadian mobile home parks are much more rustic than the US equivalent. So our mobile home parks, a lot of people I assume in Canada you see the same media products we have, which would be the movie Eight Mile with Eminem, the TV <laughs> show Trailer Park Boys, which is produced yeah. in Canada, yeah. Yeah. Myrtle Manor, Cop, yeah. and these shows all show you a slice of life which has nothing to do with the industry. That just shows you the most tiniest little microcosm of the industry. And the industry is really all about basically high, what look like high-density subdivisions. I'm not sure if people from Canada are used to what what our stuff looks like but it's it's much more attractive i think than people realize Hmm. um i mean i was just out i don't know if i can show you a photo on my phone i don't know if you can see a photo on my phone should we try a picture of uh, one of our parks from earlier today let me just pull it up here I'll, i'll tell you i'll show you a picture of a of a park that I drove through earlier today, and maybe this will help give people an idea of what we're talking about here. So hold on, I gotta, I gotta go to the park. So just a moment here. Uh, hold on here. 
I, I am not a technological wonder. That is that is well known. So hold on. Hey, you're you're traveling. You're in a hotel. You're doing a webinar. You're in a different state. It's all good. <laughs> I, okay. All right. Here, here is our uh, product. Here. Now let me turn this this way. Can you see that? It yes. All, we, yep. Yep. There we go. That is that is our product. All right. Yep. That looks there it nothing is. like what what I think most people think of when they think of mobile home park. So if you're right. thinking of the media's portrayal of trailer park, the answer is that's not what we do at all. That would be as crazy as telling someone who sells, uh, you know, Hondas that all mo all cars are old beat up jalopies missing the hubcaps. Yeah. I mean, it's it's not in any way true. I just I would throw that out because again, I'm afraid that people in Canada who don't ever drive by American mobile home parks, don't ever drive in one accidentally. They, they may think that all mobile home parks resemble Canada. And to me, Canadian mobile home parks look more like our version of RV park mm -hmm. than, than our version of mobile home park. It's like, yeah. I'm not even sure you guys really have our product, maybe because you guys are too wealthy to have that kind of need for that product. I think people in a lot of Canadian RV parks are basically people who like the rustic wilderness and that's what they like. But again, it's from the perspective of a hobbyist. Our, our stuff is more from the perspective of actual affordable housing. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. So I've, right. got, um, I've got a question here from Deb, and uh, I'm going to see if I can interpret it. Uh, Deb, let me know if I don't, if I mm -hmm. haven't got this right. Um, Frank, please speak to the newness of the group investing in this sector. Um, Deb is a former lender, and I guess inexperience is a big factor with the lenders. So, so Deb, you might just want to clarify with us: is it the um, is it the investor that we're talking about, or is it the? Uh, oh, I think I know what she's talking about. She's talking about the lenders um, are not experienced with mobile home park lending. Okay, and, and, well, most 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 lenders in America are not that experienced at one level, and then there are, are lenders that that's all they do. Uh -huh. So again, it's all over the map. You don't reach the guys that are doing it every day till you get into the loans that are a million and up because by then you're in conduit and agency debt where that's all those people do are mobile home park loans. That's all the appraisers do are mobile home park appraisals where it gets, it gets funky in that area between seller finance and the big banks because you get smaller banks and they don't know a thing about mobile home parks. And so you're often having to educate them on it. A lot of the loans we've done with those lenders came from them just willing to take a flyer on it because they couldn't figure out any way to deny the loan because the numbers were good. The appraisal came in favorably, but they just don't understand it. Because, again, all Americans grew up on the mobile home park stereotype. I'm no different. I mean, all, when I first bought my first park, the very first thing I knew I had to do was get a concealed handgun license and a pistol because every show I'd seen on mobile home parks, showed it as being just a giant crime-ridden mess. And if that were true, I wouldn't ever buy any more than the first property. But I realized the first property that had nothing to do with the business model, yeah. stopped carrying the pistol, let my concealed <laughs> handgun license lapse because I was more, at more risk of shooting myself in the foot than I was of my tenants. I never had any issue with my tenants at all. But again, that just comes from this deep-rooted stereotype I mean, we call it a stigma wall. It's really hard for people to get over that giant wall of stigma mm -hmm. of trailer mm -hmm. parks, but mm -hmm. it was created by the media. It has nothing to do with reality. It's because the U.S. media has found that if they put the word trailer park in the title to any episode of any show, they have giant viewership jumps because mm -hmm. everyone assumes it's going to be nothing but sex and violence. And that's wow. why you Canadians produce trailer park boys, right? That was the whole point of the show was – <laughs> that every episode offered a glimpse into every form of violence and insanity mm -hmm. known to man. But that when you feed uh, people on that steady diet, they, they get the wrong idea. Yeah. And that's yeah. pretty much what happened. Exactly. That, that, the, trailer, the trailer park boys is certainly not a proud uh, Canadian um, heritage uh, as far as I'm concerned. Hence why we called ourselves the trailer park girls. Because yeah. we really want to <laughs> reframe that imagery. Well, what that should yeah, really be. I don't I don't disagree with you, but you know, I I, uh, I buy because I write write so much and write all the newsletters, I'm constantly buying all of the mobile home and trailer park specific items on eBay and Etsy. Yeah. And the number one most common item is the the many books called 
trailer park boys. They have photo books, <laughs> regular books. They are the Harry Potter of books. Wow. In mobile home park. And so and the average funny. person would look at that and go, it must be the truth because they're most of the books. Yeah. And I've got my I've got my trailer park necklace on tonight, my little my little R V that I think Joan, you bought a well, blue one and I bought a red one. <laughs> you know, what's, what's crazy is the stuff a lot of the stuff that I buy on eBay and Etsy was very proud of the industry back in thirties, forties, fifties and sixties. And yeah. then the media got a hold of it in the seventies and the eighties with Jeff Hawksworthy mostly. And they suddenly realized there would be much more money in making fun of people in mobile home parks that portray them as normal people, despite the fact that 8% of Americans live in mobile homes. Yeah. So they literally then, threw that 8% yeah. under the bus and started this smear campaign that everyone lived in a mobile home park was a hillbilly, but it is, in fact, is not supported, in fact, at all. But if you're from Canada and have never seen our parks, you might think that's how it is. But this is not an industry built upon Jethro Bodine and, and hillbilly <laughs> lore. This, this is based on actual normal people. Normal, normal working class people who need good, safe, affordable. Exactly housing. correct. Well, and also, you know, we we have an upper end in in the industry. I mean, we have a lot of retired people who lived in stick built homes, and they sell those for you know two hundred fifty thousand dollars. They buy a mobile home for thirty thousand, and put the rest in the bank. So really, our clientele isn't just about affordable housing people either. We actually have a, a very mixed bag. So Frank, it's, it's, a more, it's more a fluent industry than people think. Frank, we only have about uh, uh, 10 minutes left here, tops. Um, I know that you and Dave, uh, I, or at least I think you and Dave, uh, utilize, um, you know, investment uh, opportunities for people that invest in mm -hmm. your company to build your portfolio. And that's something yep. that Lassa and I are looking to uh, create is a, up sure. here in Canada, an LLC. Uh, to bring in partners to invest in in the mobile home parks with us. Maybe you can tell the the people on the webinar a little bit about what that experience is like for your company with your investors, and 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 maybe shed some light on how it might work for us as well. Yeah, we we starting back in 2010 realized there was a, a huge opportunity in the industry because at that time interest rates had collapsed, cap rates were very attractive. So we started doing what are called Reg D 506 funds, which is something the U.S. allowed under something called the Jobs Act. It was something during the Obama era. So we started doing those. And, uh, you know, we've, we've been doing those ever since. Now, we don't have any of those open today. Today, we basically just refinance the earlier ones. But, uh, you know, it's really a win-win for everybody because it allows investors to get traditionally, a, you know, a preferred return and a profit split. So it's really, to me, you know, it, it's a big burgeoning part of the U.S. investing economy, uh, much to the chagrin of stockbrokers and public companies. Because, you know, other than these last brief moments with Trump as president, with the stock market, although not across the board, I know, I know it's seemingly soared, but not all stocks have gone up. Uh, other than that one little blip, most U.S. investments have not done particularly well for people. I mean, our bonds and stocks have not produced huge returns. And so a lot of people are looking into alternative investments because they realize the old-fashioned stuff just doesn't work. And whether it's in mobile home parks or, or pawn shops or used cars or whatever it is, people are just realizing that you got to try something new because the old stuff just doesn't work anymore. I mean, anyone who goes down to A.G. Edwards or any investment house and looks at the rates of return – is fairly appalled. And then you look also at returns, for example, of U.S. private equity groups, which are insanely low. I, the last report I saw showed a 10-year return of 4% wow. on those private equity investments of buying companies. So I've got to think the future is going to be alternative investing in real estate because at least it's asset back. The key is you got to find the right niche that's in the right, the right spot with our U.S. megatrends because there's no, there's no way you can fight them. I mean, when our megatrend shift, it's like trying to hold back the Mississippi River. It is a losing proposition. And that's what we like about mobile home parks is it seems right now to be positioned on just all the right fronts, just out of sheer luck. I mean, it isn't like when they built mobile home parks in 1950. You said, hang in there. One day we'll be right in the middle of all U.S. megatrends. It just worked out that way. 
Also remember this, that, you know, one of the first things anyone ever told me when I bought a mobile home park was that we serve the newlywed and the nearly dead. <laughs> I know it's kind of a crude, outlandish remark, but the U.S. right now has two large populations, the baby boomers, which are those born between 1946 and 1964, which they would classify as the nearly dead, based on that old-timer's remark, and then the newly wed, which would be the millennials, which are actually now a larger population segment than the boomers. Hmm. So you've got just out of sheer luck right now, both segments of the U.S. population, both of the largest sections, both needing our product. It's just a one in a million luck out that that is the way it ended up. And then the fact that America declined like it did, no one would have ever seen back in the 60s when they built these, ever think the U.S. economy would collapse as bad as it has. I mean, our stats are terrible. I don't know Canadians' debt levels. We're at almost $20 trillion. So we are now the, the, the most debt-written country in the world. Now, maybe we can turn that around. I remember back under Reagan when we were at less than $1 trillion of debt. So I'm not sure what happened. I think it was a series of wars and just bad moves. But yeah. now we have a huge amount of debt. We have huge amount of pensions. I think it's something like in the state of Illinois, 70 or 80 cents of every dollar is already taken by pensions. Wow. Right? And so, I mean, we are really set up for a lot of economic strain going forward. And, again, that's what that's our industry is built around, is built around trying to help people get affordable housing when times are tough. And because time, times are tough down in the U.S. when it comes to housing. I mean, our, as I'm sure you're aware, our median home value is 200000 roughly. But that's not really accurate. That is, that's if you take all the homes and, and add them together and divide by. But, you know, the average home transaction, I believe, now is 300 and something thousand, which means that if you are a, a, a new family unit starting out, you don't have a prayer of buying a home. No. I was actually at a conference recently that had a guy who studies the single fam family industry, and he gave a speech that it, it is impossible going forward to build an affordable single family housing product because the average lot in all U.S. cities is eighty thousand dollars. So if you say you have to build a hundred thousand dollar home to be affordable, and you start off with an eighty thousand dollar lot, there's no way you can build a hundred thousand dollar house, right? It's, it's impossible. You actually have, you'd have to have the government literally seize land and donate it to developers to have a prayer of hitting the affordable housing price point. And even if you hit the price point, I don't even know if those people could be financed, because if you look at our standard housing financing situation, it would be very, very hard for them even to qualify. So that, that's why we like where we are, because we think we're right in the sweet spot. Are there still uh, a number of states that are below a minimum wage of $10 an hour? Oh, yes. There, there's yeah. uh, the state I'm from, Missouri. Most most of your middle of America states are still at about 725. Wow. Now, there's no doubt there'll be movement. I think the problem is they're trying to move it up too, too, too fast. You can't jump from 725 to 15. That, there's no way McDonald's and Dairy Queen and those people can afford that jump. You'd be doubling their, people's labor costs overnight. Mm -hmm. I think people were kind of assuming it would go more towards 8, 9, 10, Somewhere in there. And, of course, it won't pass. I mean, there, it, it's been proposed, but they're proposing crazy stuff in American Congress every day, and it never goes anywhere. But it does show that they will do want to elevate that up. Although, to be honest with you, people can still live fairly well in a mobile home park on minimum wage. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So even if you make seven and a quarter, 14000 a year, 1200 a month, most of our residents are living for three or 400 a month for housing. Yeah. So we still meet that third of, ha of housing in a mobile home park. Obviously, you can't cut it in apartments though, with that or stick bolt. Yeah, not like us in Canada, where what is it in Victoria and Vancouver? Seventy percent of the average person's uh, income goes to their housing costs. It's just insane. It's yeah, just yeah, insane. No, that, that's crazy, and that's true in a lot of American cities as well, right? I yeah. mean, the price per square foot in a lot of California markets is a thousand dollars a foot. Yeah. Where I'm in, in in Missouri, it's about one hundred and fifty dollars a foot. So we're about a seventh of the cost of California, but yeah, there's no doubt that it's a trend, particularly in, in a lot of the more luxury, higher-end areas, that it's a very high percent of your income. Hmm. Well, well, we're I at 8 o'clock, so we'll just see if anybody's got any quick questions. There were a couple of um, sure. questions that, uh, that people asked that uh, I know we have really quick, simple answers to. Um, but if anybody's got any questions while we've got Frank on the phone, we'll take uh, 
Frank, are you good for uh, maybe another five minutes as we wrap up here? Oh, sure. Yeah, cool. sure, absolutely. That's awesome. And, and thank you. This has been uh, really uh, fun um, to be chatting with you while you're in Iowa looking at yeah. your parks. And, no uh, problem. I'm definitely excited about going to have a look uh, at Texas as soon as possible. <laughs> sure. So I think uh, there were a couple questions in here about um, – uh, what do property managers typically charge for management? I'm guessing it's probably a percentage. Um, off the top of your head, Frank, you've probably got that. Uh, yeah, the, the typical management fee that management companies charge is roughly 5% of gross, but it's not always that rigid. I've seen 3%, 4%. Uh, but it's right, right around 5%, which I think is pretty, pretty much in line with most other real estate sectors. That's much lower than the vacation rental sector, which a colleague of mine told me he pays his property manager in Whistler 42% for his property manager. Oh, my heaven. Wow. Okay. I hadn't heard anything that high, but I believe you. And said it's worth every penny. <laughs> yep. um, Mandeep wants to know, what's your opinion about uh, Kansas City for mobile home parks? Oh, we're huge, huge, huge uh, fans of Kansas City. We own a, a lot of parks around Kansas City. Uh, Kansas City is interesting to people because it's got a great, very solid employment base. You have more federal agencies with jobs there than any market besides Washington, D.C. Wow. Because in the old days, Kansas City was the gateway to the West. Uh, you've also got a huge amount of health care jobs because there's a lot of regional hospitals in Kansas City. And the reason they're there is because there's a lot of colleges in Kansas City. So you add it all together and you've got our favorite kinds of jobs, which are education, health care, and government. Uh, Kansas City also is very solid market. It rarely spikes up, but it never falls down. And housing prices are fairly high there. So we have a lot of stuff in Kansas City. Super. I know that uh, Mandeep's got an, a, a, a multifamily in, or several multifamilies in Kansas City, and she's been interested in learning a little bit more about uh, mobile home parks. So she might be making some switches. <laughs> sure. All right. Well, it's uh, just about five after eight and um, we'll probably wrap it up. So we'll have this recorded. Um, I know a few people, uh, we had a little glitch at the beginning, but we'll have it recorded. So you'll, you'll catch Frank uh, giving us some updates at the beginning. Joan, any last words from, uh, from, from North Vancouver? No, no, just a really big thank you to Frank for taking the time to join us here in Canada. <laughs> to, uh, sure, to absolutely share your, your knowledge and information with us. It's really, it's really fantastic for us to have you, um, you know, as our mentor, as we move forward with our, our mobile home investing career and our purchases. Um, and it just, it adds a ton of credibility to what we're trying to accomplish, uh, what Liza and I are trying to accomplish with the Trailer Park Girls and our investments in the States. So just want to thank you very much for taking the time to, to be here with us and, and, and all the sure. support already given us along the way has been fantastic and you know when I went no to problem. when I went to mobile home university Frank said to the entire class there was about a hundred and 120 of us in the class and he said here's my cell phone number you can call me anytime and I'm like that guy's crazy why would he, <laughs> why would he let people call him anytime and quite frankly we have called and and he answers and and it's just been amazing the type of personal support that you you give everybody that um, invests in your training and, and the, the personal support sure. you give in us. And I want to also thank you in advance for all the ex the, the phone calls coming up that we're going to have with you. <laughs> bring, 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 bring them on. I'm ready. Yeah, that's super. And yes, I know for me, sort of being the, 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 uh, the distance from Joan, but I still feel like everything's just been going along really well. And, and we've definitely had some, some questions. Uh, and I mean, we decided not to go with a small park, you know, a, a lot in, in, in fact, in, in sort of essence of what we learned uh, and the fact that we were able to relay to people who want to invest that there's some better opportunities there. And, and they've seen it so clearly that they said, okay, we're in, show us where to put the money. <laughs> so right. um, sure. so we're, we're excited to uh, get some paperwork done on that and move forward. And for those of you on the call, we're, uh, we're just getting uh, some shareholder uh, agreements and, and first paperwork uh, drawn up and we'll be ready to go. So we'll be following up very soon and planning the trip to Texas and uh, 
Uh, is one of the boot camps this year? Is it uh, in Texas in December, if I remember yes, correctly? Yes, it is. Right. We always do the last one of the year in Texas. This year, yeah. I think it's in San Antonio. Yeah, awesome. So I have a feeling Joan and I are going to be there. <laughs> Sounds great. We look forward to it. Super. Awesome. All right. Well, thank you very much, Frank. And thanks, Joan, for uh, all the great uh, questions. And uh, thanks, ladies and gentlemen, for being on the call. And we will see you on the next one, which is in, oh my gosh, it's in two weeks. And I'll tell you about it uh, after I finish my move. <laughs> Bye, everybody. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks. Thanks, for having me. thanks Frank. You bet. Thank you.